All right, everyone, it is 832. Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. I know there are some people still coming in, so we'll go ahead and, and get the uh, behind the scenes stuff out of the way. Welcome to the April morning meetup of the Arts and Culture Accessibility Cooperative Service Animals in Cultural Spaces. My name is Megan Harms and I'm the Arts and Culture Director with Mind's Eye and I will be the facilitator today. And I am a white woman in my early 40s with long gray hair. This webinar will be recorded. The recording will be emailed to all registrants in a few days. Along with the recording, you'll also receive a list of resources in a survey. And I will remind you, as always, it's very helpful to us and to our funders if you fill out the survey. The video will also be made available on Mind's Eye's YouTube channel. Today, we will be using the Q&A box and the raise your hand function. So please feel free to go ahead and drop questions in the Q&A box now or as you think of them, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. And uh, at the end, once we get to Q&A, we'll also give you permission to turn on your mics if you are more comfortable to do that with the raise your hand function. Closed captions are available via communica communication access real-time translation cart. Uh, just select the CC button on your bottom toolbar. We also have American Sign Language interpreters with us today. They are pinned and spotlighted to ensure they remain on screen th throughout the entire time for the recording. You may also want to pin them yourselves to make sure they stay on screen. So their names are David and Katie. So look for them. Live audio description is also available. We're trying something new this month. Um, so in just a minute, I'll give you instructions for that. And remember that chat to everyone has been disabled. So because of its interference with uh, screen readers. So you can still chat directly with the panelists and me as the host. Um, but if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. And as I mentioned, please remember that you will get a survey both from through Zoom and in the email that I send out. It's the same survey. It's really helpful if you fill that out. If you aren't already a member of our Facebook group, you can find us at facebook.com slash groups slash ACACSTL. And as I mentioned, we're trying something new for audio description this month. And uh, Angela, can you drop that uh, link in the chat again? <laughs> Would be great. Um, instead of using the interpretation tool for, through Zoom, which I know some of you know is, is not um, the greatest or the easiest, we're using a service called Live Voice. We're still using our Mind's Eye Describer, and today that's Sarah. And so she's live in here with her cat, and she's describing. Uh, I will say that uh, there's generally very little audio description from the Live Describer because all of our panelists usually do such a good job at describing everything that they need to. But uh, if, she, if you need anything, Sarah will be there. There is currently a large QR code on the left side of your screen. There are three ways you can get to the Live Voice app. You can use that QR code, which will take you there, and you'll have a choice between a, the browser or downloading the app. You can also, if you already have the Live Voice app, there is a code that you can enter in. It will automatically just ask you for that code, and I will tell you the code now. It's 308. 965. That's 308965. Or you can just hit the link in the chat. It will take you to the exact same place. So 308965. And hopefully uh, you will all give me some feedback on how that, that works and if it's better than the interpretation tool in Zoom. We would like to acknowledge that Mind's Eye is located in Belleville, Illinois, the ancestral lands of many people, including the tribes commonly known as the Sioux, Quapaw, Miami, Osage, Kaskaskia, and Kickapoo. We also acknowledge those tribes who pass near our area during their forced removal, including the Cherokee, Delaware, Sac and Fox, and Shawnee. The process of knowing and acknowledging the ground beneath our feet is a way of honoring and expressing gratitude for the people on this land before us. And on screen right now is a map of the St. Louis area with several overlapping colors, each representing a different tribe that lived on this land before us. And you can find the interactive map at native-land.ca, native-land.ca. Native 
And hey, hey, do you guys know it's uh, International Guide Dog Day? And yes, this is what uh, inspired us to have this topic today. So there is a graphic of a brown dog with a harness and a collar uh, on the screen right now. So happy International Guide Dog Day to all the guide dogs in the audience. I assume Kaplan is with us and I think our friend Barbara is with us and there might be some other guide dogs out there. So happy Guide Dog Day to all of you. So now I'm gonna stop sharing. so that I can introduce our panelists today. Nola is the Assistance Dog Program Director for Champ Assistance Dogs, a small service dog provider organization serving the greater St. Louis, Missouri area since 1988. Nola is a founding member of Champ and a past board president. She's been training service dogs since 1992 and visits the Champ Prison Program in Greenville, Illinois each week to lead classes for offender trainers. She's responsible for all aspects of the service dog program from selecting and educating puppies through their eventual placement as a service or facility dog. Nola is also responsible for ensuring each dog's future partner is ready to be a great partner for their dog. She's also part of the CHAMP education program and presents to groups of children and adults on topics ranging from kindness to animals to ADA DOJ regulations on access issues for service dogs it's service dog users in public places. Next, we have Seyun. Seyun is finishing up his junior year at St. Louis University with a major in social work. He'll be continuing his education to earn a master's in social work, MSW with a concentration in communities and organization development. In addition, he works as a blind community enrichment associate at Lighthouse for the Blind St. Louis and leads the arts and entertainment program. His guide dog, Kaplan, who I mentioned, has been with him since the beginning of his freshman year at SLU. Kaplan is from Guide Dogs for the Blind, the nation's largest guide dog school in North America. He accompanies Seyun in just about all of their explorations as he works with numerous attractions in the area to, to promote visitor experience and accessibility for blind and visually impaired students. Nicole Lanahan is the executive director at Gotcha Six Support Dogs, a nonprofit organization that helps veterans and first responders suffering from PTSD with a specialty, specially trained dog and therapeutic services at no charge. She is a certified professional dog trainer who has developed who has helped dog owners effectively communicate, bond, and modify unwanted pet behavior for over 15 years. Along with pet obedience and behavior modification, Nicole has trained police, military, and service dogs. Got Your Six Support Dogs supports vet veterans and first responders who have risked their lives to serve our community. And its goal is to help those who struggle with PTSD as well as sexual trauma receive a trained PTSD service dog at no cost to help, from, to help them heal from psychological stress of war and duty through compassion and healing of their four-legged companions. Thank you all so much. I'm so glad to have you guys with us today. I am going to turn off my camera so we can focus on you. Um, and Nola, once, uh, if you wanna go first, and actually before I do that, sorry everyone, I'm going to turn on the spotlight for Katie to make sure everyone sees her. There we go. Um, thanks for pointing that out, Angela. And uh, now I'm gonna turn off my camera and my microphone and uh, Nola, you can go first. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. I really appreciate the invitation to, to be one of the panelists. Um, I don't need to tell this audience just how important uh, cultural, uh, cultural events uh, are in our community and what they mean to those of us. They, they allow us to be, um, I think more fully a part of our community. And that is something that not only individuals with disabilities, but everybody needs to be able to experience that. So we're really happy about the topic today because I think it's crucial that um, everybody has access to these invaluable resources. And they make our lives so much richer uh, to be able to partake in these things. And it should be that uh, equally for everyone. There's a lot of information out there, a lot of misinformation about uh, access. So we really appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk with you about that. Um, one of the things I'd like to do 
just to tell you a little bit about Champ, uh, I, I think I heard um, in the intro that uh, since 1988, and actually we've been, uh, we've, I've been with Champ since 1998 is when we first started Champ. Um, but I'd like to show you a short video. It's one of our, one of our public access service dog partners. Um, his name is Don, his service dog's name is Rook. They did not do a lot out in public over the last couple of years, obviously, but um, uh, they, I think the video really shows the bond. And quite honestly, that's one of the things that we love at Champ. It's not just that we are able to uh, provide service dogs that can help you know, um, assist someone with the tasks that they need during their daily lives, but also that bond is phenomenal. And I think you'll see some of that when, uh, when you watch the video with Don and Rook. Um, we also have a therapy dog program. We also have an education program. We do a lot of presentations in schools and um, with, for civic groups. We also do for um, many businesses have asked us to come in and talk about access, um, assistance dogs access. And it's a topic that's near and dear to our hearts because everybody, everybody needs to be able to participate fully in our society. So uh, I'd like to show you this video. Uh, hope you enjoy it. I'll be back after this. Let's see if we can get this going. So this, whoops, I believe I need to share my screen first. There we go. And here and share, okay. One of the most important elements of the CHAMP mission is to always celebrate the joy inherent in the canine human bond. You'll see what we're talking about in this next segment featuring Don and public access service dog Rook. Don and his wife Kelly were mountain biking in Colorado when an accident changed their lives forever. In normal times, Rook accompanies Don when he goes to the gym or maybe out to eat. This year, of course, it's been a little bit different, and Rook mainly does his magic around their home. Um, he does a few things for me. He'll pick Rook. things up off the floor if I drop them. Take it. Bring it. Give it. Good. Good boy. Um, he will come and get Kelly. Sometimes when Kelly gets up before I do, and Rook, Rook and I will be in the bedroom with the door closed. And if I wake up and I need Kelly for something, I can give him the command and he'll come out and get Kelly and bring her back. That's one of the big things he does for me. Oh, he's such a joy to have around. He's so much fun. His antics, the things he does. Give me five. Give me five. That a boy, yeah. Give me five. The funniest thing is the way he sleeps. I mean, I've never seen a dog contort himself the way he does. He's on his back, he's all sideways, and feet going every which way. It's kind of comical to watch him sleep sometimes. Yeah, he gets his core work in. Yeah, he is very attentive. All I have to do is call his name. He gave me sound asleep over there. And when I call his name, he just pops up immediately and just is attentive and, okay, what's going on? Yeah, I, I sometimes get bad spasms or I cry out in pain from doing that. And when that happens, he comes running over and he's right in front of me looking like, you okay, are you okay? Well, I like having him here because it gives me a little bit of comfort knowing that he can come and get me if Don needs me. Even if I go out for a little bit, Take door. he can open the door if somebody needs to get in or, um, you know, for an emergency. Good boy, good. As far as having him here, oh, he's brought a lot of joy to this place. Um, he's always making us laugh, like Don said. Happy birthday, buddy! He's so verbal with um, with trying to tell you things. And he's so proud. And it just makes us laugh. <laughs> I like that he's so attentive to Don. And they have their little um, way of communicating because Don's not real mobile to be able to cut him a whole lot. And Rook knows that he has to go on a certain side 
and be in a certain spot and then Don can kind of scratch his back and they stand there as long as Don's arm holds out and as long as he wants to stand there. So <laughs> it's just really sweet. We really want to let Champ know how grateful we are that you provided us with Rook. He has been the best thing to happen to this house in quite some time. Um, he brings us joy, eases our mind a little bit. We couldn't have asked for any better, and we do really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I just the porch. Oh, here. Is sorry, still going. Um, I think part partly what I love about that video is it shows not just some of the things that we can do for Don, but the joy that that dog brings to the household. And it's not just for the person that the dog is placed with. You'll notice Kelly also. Uh, a couple, for a couple of years after Don's accident, Kelly did not leave the house or was very uncomfortable leaving the house because she didn't want to leave Don home alone in case something happened. Once we placed Rook in there, uh, she was able to get back out and start doing, you know, exercising, other, other you know, cycling, other kinds of things that she uh, would normally do in her, her life also. So it impacts not just the, the actual person that we're serving, but uh, it's the entire family. So we're really happy about that placement. And, and uh, that's just like a short little snapshot of what Champ does. And we really appreciate your, your uh, being here today. So, Sue Young. All right, yes. hello. Hey, can you hear me okay? I think it's, I'm coming through. All right. Yep, you're good. Thanks, Megan. So good morning. I am, I am just thrilled to be a panelist this morning um, to talk a little bit about kind of, of, of guide dogs and, and some of the things I do. So um, I know Megan did a handful of introductions on me today. So I do wear a couple different hats and then I wanna talk a little bit about um, my involvement with the Lighthouse for the Blind and then the, how we promote really just that cultural space inclusivity um, by working uh, as I work with different businesses, a, little, a lot of different attractions in the area. So a couple of housekeeping things I wanted to share about um, the Lighthouse. So in 2005, we started a See the Future program, which is um, which are various different programs kind of empowering blind and visually impaired um, young adults and youth. So we have outreach, but various community outreach program like sports camp. We send a group of kids to space camp for interested visually impaired students. That's a week long program in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, we also have sports camp weekend. We have a lot of um, comprehensive low vision clinic and we have summer adaptive um, summer, summer Orientation and Mobility Adaptive Living Resource Program, SOAR. That's like a three-week um, intensive program for uh, folks ages between 16 to 21 who are blind and visually impaired. So they move into Webster University um, and then they, they learn for three weeks how to, how to get, get taken care of their own needs, how, how to pay you know, their, their restaurant bills, how to manage their money, how to cook, um, kind of a lot of different different domains of instruction. So they do that for three weeks. And the program that I lead is called Arts and Entertainment Accessibility. So um, I myself am blind. Um, as Megan introduced me earlier, um, I'm finishing up my third year at SLU um, in, the, in the Community Development Social Work. Um, eventually that's where I'd like to do. Um, and Kaplan is, is a, he's a, he's a very mas masculine kind of black lab of guide dogs so he's from guide dogs for the blind um, he's from oregon campus um, and i had him for close to three years so he's he's four years old he's actually laying on my foot which is keeping my foot super warm and to make sure he doesn't go anywhere um that's just his habit but <laughs> um he he could go anywhere but i mean he goes from guiding to snoring in seconds this is quite impressive so he has really a couple different um capabilities and, and tasks that he's trained to for, perform. And one of them is to obviously guide when that harness comes through. Um, his primary job is to keeping, keeping me safe and kind of um, away from different obstacles. So a couple of those examples I had um, when I was thinking about this, um, 
sometimes I don't even notice it because he does his job so well. So he he's really responsible for for um, keeping me away from like different uh, like different obstacles that pops up in our walkway. Um, he also knows how to get trap how to handle traffic. So. Um, He's basically a pilot, so as a blind handler, I am responsible for for directing him to to where he needs to go, so that he knows these like forward, left, right commands, and the halt command. Kind of different. These 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 different commands kind of indicate like this is where I need to go. So as a handler, I have to have a very good sense of awareness to know where I am um, in relation to where everything is, and then making sure that I could direct him. And us as a team, so we work as a team, um, to make sure that we're we're going to these places safely and efficiently. So I spend a lot of time getting acquainted to different spaces. Um, a lot of guide dog handlers will have a really small, like foldable white cane. So if they need to explore their tactile ground, they can just open up their cane, and then we what we call healing a dog. So instead of using a harness, um, we just heal the dog, walk on leash, um, and then you could explore the surroundings. Um, guide dogs are also responsible for like um, back chaining, so different targeting, different things. And I'm sure we could talk a little bit more about that today. Um, but being able to find a chair, being able to find find tables, countertops, so that that makes our travel super duper efficient. Um, now I. So with with the lighthouse for the blind, I, I travel to different places. So I I as as we kind of move beyond like this this post pandemic era. Um, I'm really looking forward to traveling to more places with him. Um, and basically, I, I, I seek the guide dog option. I've tried it um, at a summer experience program a couple of years ago. And I was like, this is this is so efficient. Like why have a cane and try to try to navigate different obstacles myself. Um, so we, we give different analogies for that. So kind of canes is almost like you navigate the obstacles and, and locate them, whereas the guide dog kind of keeps um, keeps you away from the obstacles. So that that's just been super efficient and super super uh, quick too. So be, because you don't have to spend time navigating through different obstacles. So he is basically I, I like I put my life in his hands. So it's it's quite. I guess, I guess hands is not the right word. It would be to pause, right? <laughs> um, so basically, that's what he's in charge of. Um, and then he just makes navigating through college environments super, super efficient. And I'm sure um, with many places I'll get to poke out this summer and beyond, um, we make sure that, that we could we can access these places with him. So that's, that's basically what I got. So I think, who is next? Thanks, Sayun. Nicole, you're up next. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nicole Lanahan. I am, I'm going to follow the previous lead. I'm 42 years old, female, uh, brown hair. It's really gray, but I've dyed it brown. <laughs> I am uh, the executive director of Got Your Six Support Dogs. We are a nonprofit in Maryville, Illinois that trains and places PTSD service dogs with veterans and first responders at no cost to them. And it's kind of a funny story how I, I came upon this because as you heard from my bio, I've, I've been training uh, pre 9-11. Uh, so for over 20 years now training dogs and what happened, mental health has always been a passion of mine, mental health and dogs. And actually what happened, I first started to hear about PTSD service dogs probably 10 years ago. And admittedly, when, when I tell people this, they're surprised. I was a huge skeptic when I heard about PTSD service dogs because I had done some training for diabetic seizure alert service dogs. I had done training for mobility service dogs. But PTSD service dogs was relatively new. And for me, I thought that they kind of fell in line with emotional support animals that mainly when I heard about them, my understanding was they just made you feel good because you have a dog near you. And the Americans with Disabilities Act states a service dog has to be able to perform a task. I didn't understand yet what the task was that a PTSD service dog performed 
So again, I was a huge skeptic. And when I had some people come to me and ask about them, in my mind, they really, I was thinking, oh, you just want to take your dog out in public with you. PTSD service dogs aren't real service dogs. They're not performing a task. Well, I was very, very wrong. <laughs> and and I've, I've learned that and I am a huge convert because now I understand all the wonderful things PTSD service dogs do, how they can actually with the, some of their anxiety interruption tasks, they can interrupt panic signals in the brain, keep the brain from going into fight, flight, or freeze so that you're able to stay in frontal lobe and stay in reasoning and logic. This helps people who suffer from PTSD, who suffer from anxiety, stay in interactive social situations. So they literally are life-changing uh, service animals. Another big passion of mine is advocating for those with service dogs. I go to, well, before COVID, I haven't been since COVID, but we're, we're doing that again this year. Uh, before COVID, I would go once a year to Washington DC with another group and actually lobby for stricter service dog laws because we have found, especially with our, our recipients who receive PTSD service dogs, they do have social anxiety. And when you're confronted with somebody in a social situation that's telling you, no, you cannot come in this facility. No, you cannot come in this venue. You cannot come in this restaurant with this pet. And then now there's an altercation. This exasperates the situation, makes makes somebody who's in recovery not want to go back out again. So it actually can set back, this kind of situation can set back PTSD recovery, anxiety recovery after they've had this negative situation. We've also had situations where some of our recipients encounter uh, a fake service dog that has attacked their dog out in public. And this kind of situation sets them back as well as can set the training and well-being of the service dog back as well. So again, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for trained service animals uh, and public awareness because regardless of, of why you need a service dog, it's important that nobody's, that the public is educated on the, their importance, their ac your, your access rights, as well as keeping the untrained dogs out and keeping the non-service dogs out of public access. So really I'm super, again, we're, we're hitting all of my passions today, mental health, service dogs, access. So I'm just so excited to be here answer any questions, uh, talk about anything anybody wants to talk about, dig into the law. I'm very well, I've, I was talking to a lawyer yesterday and actually educated them quite a bit on some of the service dog laws, which is always fun for me. Uh, so I'm super excited to see uh, or in, and hear what everyone has, has on their mind and really kind of dig into this. And as a side note before I, I turn it over to questions. Uh, if anybody wants to contact me directly, you can go to gotyour6supportdogs.org. Hit that contact button. If you, if you think later on, oh, I really have a question for Nicole and she didn't get to it, just contact me there and I'm happy to answer. But I'm, I'm ready for what, what you, and I'm sure all the other panelists are ready for what you wanna know, uh, what, what your questions are. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, when I I read on, I guess probably on the Gotcha Six website or maybe on the Facebook page that you were originally a skeptic um, about it, I, I was so glad to read exactly the process that you took that you just explained to us, like why you why you thought the way you did and the science behind it that made you change your mind and made you understand these are not emotional support dogs. And you know what, there are plenty of emotional support dogs out there that do lovely work. Um, but today we're talking about service animals. <laughs> and um, so I was really glad to hear um, <clears throat> exact, because I think a lot of people think the same thing and people don't understand that there are PTSD service animals, that they are not, there are people that have emo emotional support dogs, but there are service animals. And we are going to, in just a minute, we're gonna go through um, 
some slides about the law. But before we do that, I wanted to ask kind of a, a general question for all you, all of you about the task, the specific tasks that some of the service dogs will do. Um, and because you, you guys are all dealing with different types of service dogs. I, that was um, another, that was the main reason we chose the three of you, that you were all working with different types of service dogs. And uh, the, the most important thing is they're all doing different types of tasks and they're doing tasks. So um, if someone wants to say, you and if you want to go first and tell us some specific tasks that your dog does, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I talked a little about this earlier, but I want to maybe get a little bit in depth of, of, of a little bit more kind of like technical piece of, of what, what Kaplan does for me. So uh, when we're out and about, his harness stays on. So that is almost like... I call it a driver's license equivalent that allows him to make sure that that like he's in working mode, so he knows when that harness comes on. Um, when he was a puppy, actually, um, so these dogs are puppies that are, are bred in house um, to specifically become guide dogs. Now, not not all dogs make it. About only fifty percent of them actually make it through the entire training program. So once they're born, they are exposed to a lot of different elements to see how they how, how they can handle how, how they adapt. Um, um, and then once they're once they're comfortable in that environment, they really thrive in that environment. They're home to um, many many puppy raisers that volunteer for guide dogs for the blind. So he uh, Kaplan was um, his puppy raiser's thirteenth puppy. So she she had quite a bit of experience raising puppies for guide dogs. Um, and she's, he spent about a year um, at her house basically getting socialized and getting his puppy jacket on. There's lots and lots of just adorable pictures that she, she got for me, um, which is just quite incredible. Um, she took him to schools, um, different, different public places. Um, he also slept in Costco boxes, which I think is just, just awesome. Um, so he, he had a lot of social exposure exposure to be from from the very beginning because he was already I mean he's shown a lot of initiative as a puppy too and, and he really enjoyed and thrived in this environment and a lot of working dogs really love what they do I mean there is a really really weird misconception that um, service animals are are inherently not ethical um, in in the animal rights space I've heard that from several people while I was walking out in the bell going about my day and then you're like and some folks came up to me and and said why why are you working this dog this dog doesn't deserve this and I said that he really enjoys what he does you could you could just tell by by his 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 drive and his his energy um he, he I think he enjoys it way more than some some pets that just sit at home um so he, once he's been through that initial kind of puppy raising phase, he, he returns, he gets recalled, um, gets tested for, for different medical anomalies. Um, and once that passes, um, he starts his formal training. This happened in 2019. Um, so he returned to guide dogs in Oregon. Um, and then he started his intensive training. That's where they learn a, a bulk of, of what they know how to do. So, so that's anywhere from um, how to safely lead a handler, a blind handler, handler down the street, down the sidewalk, um, how to make turns efficiently, where to stop to point obstacles, how to get on escalators. Believe it or not, they, they're, he's a better escalator rider than I ever will be. So, I mean, it, it's quite impressive um, how to get on elevators, how to how to keep the sand handler safe, how to get traffic checked. So um, those are really a lot of the tasks that he's responsible for. Um, just as a comment on the site note, there was there was a couple students when I actually came to SLU my freshman year who pulled up, pulled me over a side and asked if I, my dog had identified colors and, and if they could count, count money. Um, that's not what he does. <laughs> Uh, his his sole goal is to keep me safe and then to, to guide me around different places. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, he is he, his primary responsibility is to to keep me away from different dangers and obstacles ahead of me. So if I am visiting a cultural space, um, I want to say like a, a Missouri Botanical Garden, for instance, we visited there um, a couple of months ago uh, for me to do my facility evaluation, and I really enjoyed my time there um 
And then his goal was to, as, as, as destructive as it can be um, with all the plants and flowers, um, he, I, I, um, he has to keep his head up um, while he's on duty. Um, keep me on a straight path. Um, follow the curvature of the path if there are any. Um, if there was something um, like moving elements that, that warrants my attention, he would tend to just stop for a second. So I can reach out and touch and see what is going on. He's supposed to stop at the top or the bottom of the staircase or at the curve cut. So before he, we actually cross the street, he always stops at the curve um, to indicate that we reached the end of the block, um, which is super helpful when I'm walking around here at Sluice campus, um, the North campus, um, where it's very pedestrian friendly. And then you, yes, I can feel like um, truncated domes under my foot to indicate that we're about to cross the street. But he'll also make that stop right at the curve cut. And we use our foot to to feel where the curve cut is so we don't like step out on the streets. Um, and we also work a lot on like targeting as well and back chaining. So if I want him to find the same door to a class all the time, every time, this is where a guide dog really plays in a huge advantage. Um, um, I could just work on that with like a food reward, we use that quite a lot. And I have a clicker that's like, basically it's a marker. It's a verbal, um, audible marker that, that a lot of guide dog handlers use and actually guide dog training schools use to indicate like, I'm going to touch the door and I'm going to have you find it. So we, I literally put the hand on one, one hand on my door and I click with my other hand and then I'd feed him just to kind of reinforce that behavior. And then we start adding distances and then like this whole, tr the whole back chaining process takes about two minutes. So we try to keep that very short and condensed because if it's too long, um, the dogs kind of loses focus and gets really bored. Um, Kaplan really enjoys uh, back chaining work. Um, and now he's able to find just about all my classes once I am near to the proximity. Uh, one of the classes actually underground. So I'd go down a series of steps. Um, he'd stop at the top of the stairs. Um, and then he, I tell him to make an immediate left around the staircase and then he'll go find that exact door and it's always the right door. So it is, it's quite impressive. And then it is just, it makes traveling so much more efficient. And then beyond the context of school, when we travel to museums and cultural spaces, um, he, he, he's very challenged. He likes tra traveling new places more than this familiar old routes. Um, so when we're visiting out of town or, or even new places around the area, um, he just thrives in a new environment so much to see, so much to hear, so much to just sniff. And then he, he is very engaged in his task as long as I'm holding the harness. Well, and when that comes off, he's, he's no different than a pet. I mean, he, he can get petted. He, he, will, he will jump on you even occasionally and, and he'll go around and look people, lick people's feet and, and do all these puppyish behavior um, to this day. Um, but when the harness comes on, his, he keeps it so calm and so um, reserved. It's, it's, that's, the task that he's able to perform is, is still mind-blowing to me. And it just makes my life um, as an active traveler much, much easier. Excellent. Th thank you, Sayun. I, I would love um, to see a dog count money. That would be um, am right. <laughs> amazing. Yeah, that'd be quite amazing. <laughs> Nola, I think you wanted to um, add something. Uh, uh, about Champ, uh, yes, we train service dogs uh, that work with people who have disabilities other than uh, vision or hearing impairment. Um, a lot of our dogs will do tasks like retrieve items for their person. Uh, you saw in the video uh, where Rook went to find, uh, we have a aware command where they will go and find another person in the home. Um, and we have a, an emergency 911 retrieve the dog. If a person needs it, the dog will run and, and find the phone. Um, so a lot of things like that just to, to help their partners out and turn lights off and on. It's, we do train, we're, we're a small group. And we train specifically for what a particular individual needs. All of our dogs have a basic set of skills, which includes retrieves and you know walking nicely and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we train specifically for what a particular person needs. Um, we don't have a kennel. Uh, we never wanted one. All of our dogs live with their handlers. Uh, we have puppy raisers in the St. Louis area. Uh, they come to our office for individual classes once or twice a week. 
uh, one person comes three times a week <laughs> for individual classes. And they, we also have um, group classes in addition, and we have a prison program that we're working with. Um, currently, it's Greenville, Illinois. It's a federal correction facility. Uh, previously, for almost 19 years, we were in a women's prison here in the state of Missouri, uh, Missouri Department of Corrections, but they kind of repurposed that prison and um, unfortunately we lost our prison program there so we recently started at greenville we're getting those ladies up to speed so our dogs rotate between their puppy raisers in the st louis area and the prison um, program so it's going really well uh typically we we place maybe five seven dogs in seven dogs maybe in a good year but this last couple of years have been kind of odd for us like for everybody else um, but yeah, that's essentially how it works. Our dogs will typically be around two years old uh, when they're placed. We do all the health clearances on the dogs. Um, and the, like I said, the dogs are trained individually for what a particular person's needs are. We place public access dogs as well as home-based dogs. So some of the individuals we work with really don't need a dog when they're out in public. Um, they may always be accompanied by someone. Um, so they may have a dog that's trained specifically to work with them around the home. So we also work with the children, um, children and adults. So a little bit about our program. Um, did, did you want to do the slideshow now or later? Or yeah, let's, thought? let's okay. go ahead. I, I would like to go through those quickly because there's so much good information about, um, ADA and laws in there and so many of the people who are in attendance today are coming from cultural spaces and I want to yeah. make sure that everybody understands uh, the law and what their service animal policy is because you should all have a service animal policy and it's all basically the same <laughs> you have one okay. awesome. <laughs> so if you would go ahead and share the screens and and we'll do Absolutely. a very this will be obviously be a very abridged version of what NOLA would do for training um, but I want to make sure that everybody gets these slides. Okay, so we're going to start the slideshow. Um, we do it's, we do a lot of educational outreach, and we do get a lot of requests from, you know, businesses, civic groups, all a bunch of different places. Our education programs are geared specifically towards what a particular group needs. And when we're going into places like we presented a longer version of this, uh, for example, the St. Louis Zoo, Botanical Gardens, uh, a couple of different places. Um, longer versions of this where we do role playing, which is kind of fun, but, but um, this is kind of a short version. And I'm going to share my screen here. Find it, share screen. And I'm going to do this one. Okay, start on the slide. Um, start. Okay. Hopefully, you can all see that. Um, so yep, just, we can see. Yeah, who we are with all of our different programs here. CHAMP stands for Canine Helpers Allow More Possibilities. Um, just some information about CHAMP. We incorporated in 1998. We are 501c3 charitable. Our main area of service is the greater St. Louis, Missouri area. We do have a few dogs that are placed a little bit further afield, but mostly right here in St. Louis. We are a fully accredited uh, member of Assistance Dogs International. And I always forget this part, I don't know why, but all of our service and facility dogs are provided free of charge. <laughs> so I'm not sure I always forget that. Um, we use this slide because there, there's a lot of um, information out there about you know, people aren't really sure what these different terms mean. Um, a lot of you have heard about service dog, assistance dog, courthouse dog, therapy dog. And of course, emotional support dogs. So what exactly do all of these mean? We're not gonna go into all of them today because we're pretty much focusing on service dogs, assistance dogs, because those are the ones uh, where ADA and Department of Justice regulations uh, come into play. But we do kind of wanna put those in a little grouping here for you. And uh, over here in the green box uh, are the assistance dogs and service dogs. These are dogs that are as it says, specially selected, individually trained uh, to assist a partner who has a disability. The important part here is they are covered by ADA and Department of Justice regulations uh, for public access purposes. And we're talking guide dogs, hearing dogs, service dogs. Um, the other categories of dogs here that we have, um, they can do tremendous work. We train facility dogs also, and they're phenomenal dogs, but they're not covered by ADA because they do not work with someone who has a disability. 
So, uh, and same also with emotional support and comfort animals. We're gonna cover those in a little bit more detail in just a sec. Um, and one thing down here in the lower right is the terminology does vary somewhat between different regulatory agencies, whether you're talking about Department of Justice, Fair Housing Act, uh, the air carriers, I can't remember what the AA stands for, but some of them use like slightly different variations on terminology, which um, kind of drives me crazy sometimes, but you know, <laughs> but according to the DOJ regulations, a service animal is any dog and also miniature horses uh, that has been individually trained to do work or perform tasks for a person with a disability. And every one of those elements is crucial. If it doesn't meet all of those things, it is not considered to be a service animal. The work or tasks, um, to, to do work or perform tasks is actually interesting because it has to be something over and above something like my dog walks like nicely on a leash. I have a very nice dog. He's very unobtrusive. That's awesome, but it does not rise to the level of a task uh, that would qualify an animal to be a service animal. It has to be something that helps to mitigate that person's disability. Uh, all of us have, uh, most of us, I think, have probably seen guide dogs out working. They are amazing and phenomenal and uh, love watching them work. The hearing dogs, um, all of us have, or may have met someone who uses hearing dogs. Um, and then service dogs, this is one of our teams here on the, on the right hand side with the service dogs. It's a couple and they've got their service dog, Sonny, who recently passed away, unfortunately. Um, they are both wheelchair users and uh, Sonny was helping both in the home and uh, at her job. So psychiatric service dogs, or emotional support and comfort animals. I think this is probably where some of the confusion comes in. A psychiatric service dog has trained skills and they do meet ADA and DOJ requirements for being uh, considered a service dog. And the skills, Nicole would be much more adept at answering, you know, giving you more details on this, but anything from interrupting or redirecting harmful behaviors, um, you know, noticing when someone's anxiety level starts to rise and the dog uh, can come up, put a paw on them and say, hey, you know what? Um, how about pet me instead? Or something that's, that's going to redirect that before those behaviors escalate. So they do have trained skills and they meet ADA DOJ requirements. Unlike emotional support and comfort animals, they are not considered service animals. They are considered pets. They can be any species. Um, a species that is meaningful to that person and brings them comfort, but they do not have the trained skills and they don't meet ADA and DOJ requirements. And they can be any any species. You see a pig here. Um, uh, we've all heard about the, the uh, peacock that someone tried to take on an airplane before. Uh, so there's they're, uh, they are not covered by ADA or DHA, uh, DOJ, and there is no requirement to allow them access in public places. So when you're talking about animals that uh, may come into your cultural institutions, either a dog or a miniature horse uh, passes that first criteria. Um, is this a real service dog? We got a picture here of a cute, fluffy little white dog who is um, in a cute little black and pink, like a pocket purse kind of a thing, a po pocket puppy. Is this a real service dog? How about this one? Here we have a bully breed, a very, very uh, pretty dog with a massive um, prong collar on and a um, nice little uh, look directly into the camera. So is this a real service dog? Well, according to ADA and DOJ, there are no requirements on it. Does, your dog doesn't have to be any specific breed, any specific size. And the last update the, uh, from several years ago, and I was not aware of this one. This one kind of took me by surprise. Quantity. Um, it actually is um, potentially okay for someone to be out in public and come in with three different dogs, and they could all be their service dogs. Um, that one surprised me, um, but but it is in the DOJ regulations, and I think we'll uh, I will uh, send the links towards. There's a lot of great information on the DOJ website. Uh, I think all of you should probably 
uh, take a peek at, at some time. Um, so yeah, it's kind of kind of interesting because a lot of people will look at that first dog that we showed, um, the, the cute little fluffy dog, and say that can possibly be a service dog because they are picturing a dog that is either going to be doing guide work or maybe opening doors for someone. And no, the dog's not large enough for that, but most certainly might be a dog that could help someone with a hidden disability if, say, they're going to have a uh, um, possibly going to have a seizure or something like that. So a small dog like that, yeah, they absolutely uh, could potentially be service animals. There are no requirements that they be registered or marked in any way. This one takes a lot of people by surprise. Uh, if someone comes to your establishment and they have a dog that maybe has a nice little leash, a nice little collar, but does not have a cape that says, I'm a service dog, doesn't have a special collar, doesn't have a special ID, anything like that, a lot of people's assumption might be that that couldn't possibly be a service dog. But there really are no requirements that a service dog be registered by anybody or marked in any way in order to actually be a service dog. So <laughs> these, these always kind of cracked me up a little bit. Um, service dog vets, you can get those right off of Amazon. Some of them are on actual real service dogs um, because service dogs don't have to come from any particular organization. A lot of individuals do choose to get their service animals from an organization, but you can self-train your own service dog. That's fine. As long as the dog is good in public and has the right temperament, the right skills, um, that's perfectly legitimate. So some dogs, there's some capes people purchase off of Amazon are going on real service dogs, but some are not. And the one in the middle with that full access required by law, it's a service dog badge. Well, that's yeah, worth nothing, um, seriously, because it's there's no requirement that the dogs be have anything like that. There is no requirement for certification or badge or anything else. And then the one on the right here, the big gold badge, the commission, special U.S. service dog, full access, that is also meaningless. And I would say that they're actually a little bit worse than meaningless because um, we have heard of cases before where say you have a say you have a, a couple of individuals with dogs come into your establishment and the first person comes in and they have that badge, they have that that um, you know, you know, all of the accoutrements there for, for that says this is a service dog. Well, maybe it is. But the next person that comes to your establishment and has none of this stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't a service dog. Most organizations like CHAMP uh, and most organizations I'm aware of, we require that our public access service dog users have their dogs in our branded cape. They have a badge, they have you know, the dog, uh, it has pictures, all that information on the badge. But that's because they're coming from, that's an organization requirement. It is not required by any laws. Um, if someone comes in with their dog, there's really only two questions that you're allowed to ask. Is the dog a service dog required because of a disability? If they answer yes, you can ask what type of work or task has the dog been trained to perform? These are the only two questions, the only ones you are allowed to ask. And number two, quite honestly, I've been working with service dogs since the early 90s. What type of work or task has a dog been trained to perform? If someone answers, well, he makes me feel good because he's here, no, that would be considered an emotional support animal and not a service dog. But the list of actual real tasks that a real service dog could do is practically endless. I would have to think pretty hard if someone gave me some answers on you know, what might be um, uh, a task their dog's been trained to perform. I'd actually have to think pretty hard about some of them. Is, is that serious, really? Um, because the, the list of skills is really quite extensive. So it's not as simple as my dog retrieves things when I drop them. It could be a wide, wide range. Um, and just as important about as the questions, the two questions you are allowed to ask are things that you cannot ask. You can't ask about someone's disability. It's none of your business, none of my business. You can't ask uh, for, for any kind of medical documentation. Again, nobody's business. 
You can't require any training documentation or certification for the dog. It's not required. And you can't ask that the dog demonstrate the skills. They have to be able to tell you what their dog can do or what tasks the dogs can do, but you can't ask they demonstrate. And this all falls under privacy. It's, it's really, it's none of our business uh, what someone's disability might be. Um, so kind of interesting. So a few things to remember, that person with a disability has the right to have their service dog with them. The dog itself has no rights to be anywhere, but that person who has a disability is able to have their dog with them. We're talking about public access places. It doesn't apply everywhere. And there's information in the, the DOG uh, regulations that are, give you more specific insight into exactly where and uh, what's considered a public place and stuff like that. Um, they can't be treated any differently than anybody else. So if they come into your restaurant, they come into your facility, you can't say, oh, you have to go over there because you have a dog. You can't do that. It's, it's not allowed. Uh, you may exclude service dogs from limited specific locations where the simple fact that it's a dog is the issue. As an example, at the St. Louis Zoo, when we do this talk at the zoo, there are, uh, I think, maybe four places at the zoo. An entire zoo is open, except for, uh, as an example, the antelope house itself, inside the antelope house because bringing a predator inside the antelope house tends to send the antelope crazy and they you know, can hurt themselves in those close confinements. They will try to escape and run into walls. So there, it's a clear, no, you can't have a dog because. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's possible that there are some areas where you wouldn't have a dog, but it has to be a real reason. You also can't have a dog in the hospital uh, in a burn unit, there's the infection issue. So stuff like that, but they are few and they are quite limited. You may and should require a service dog user to remove their dog if the dog's out of control. The dog is um, having you know, accidents or is growling at or any inappropriate behavior towards other people, you're concerned about health and safety, absolutely you can ask that they remove their dog, but um, it's the dog. You, you can invite them to return without their dog, but, but their dog is the one that can't allow in. Assistance dogs and training. This is a topic that really isn't covered by Department of Justice regulations. However, um, each of the individual states has their own um, like puppy laws or, or trainer access laws um, because um, prior to these coming into effect, it's like we had to beg for uh, uh, access to take our dogs out when we were training with our dogs. Uh, everybody thought, I guess, the dogs, service dogs just magically appeared where they knew how to behave out in public and they were two years old, they're ready to be placed, boom, they're, they're fantastic. When reality is the dogs have to be socialized to all of this kind of stuff. So we start with puppies as most organizations do to get them comfortable and um, uh, just behaving well out in public. And I think both Missouri and Illinois have pretty good trainers laws where our dogs can essentially go pretty much anywhere that an actual working service dog can go. Service dog etiquette, we always do cover this very briefly. Um, if you meet someone who's working with a service dog out in public, please help the dog be successful. Um, speak to the person, not the dog. Um, a lot of people, if they have time, would love to tell you a little bit about their dogs, but please don't distract the dog. That includes don't use the dog's name if you know it, please don't touch them. We've had a few, a few issues over the years with people trying to do little drive-by pettings. The dog's passing by them, they just can't resist, they wanna reach out and touch the dog. No, don't, because you should not, please don't distract the dog while it's working. If it's a counterbalanced dog, like you see right here in this picture, if that dog were distracted and turned around to look at somebody, his partner actually might fall. So uh, please let the dog do his or her job without interference. I think that's it for me. And just, yeah, any questions anybody has, I'm gonna stop the share here. So, um, so we'll turn that back over and here's our cute little Elliot miniature poodle with our thank you. But let me stop this right. 
Thank you, okay. Nola. There's so much great information in there. And I think so much of this applies to cultural space. Well, all of it, all of it applies to cultural spaces. All of it mm -hmm. applies to everything. Um, but the, the things that I want to point out are the, the two questions. Remember, those are the only two questions that you can ask when someone walks in the building. And honestly, I think most places would just be asking the first question, is this a service dog that performs a task, a specific task? Um, and here's something that we run into a lot. <clears throat> it's really great that everyone who is participating today, who is here at this webinar, they know these rules. But does the person at the front door does the usher that only works every fourth Wednesday, does the security guard who it's, you know, not their regular day, does the very first person who is the person that would first meet this dog understand these rules and these laws? Um, because oftentimes I will ask someone, what's your service animal policy? And I'll get a blank stare or I'll say, oh yeah, yeah, of course, service animals, great, okay. Um, but also that look of panic of, yes, we obviously do have a service animal policy. I just don't know what it is. So all of you, that's your policy. Service animals are welcome, <laughs> period. Um, and know what those two questions are and know what you can ask and make sure that everyone in your organization understands that. Um, and we have a ton of questions. It's 9.33. We have just uh, just a little bit less than a half an hour. So I want to make sure um, to get to all the questions. Um, anybody stop me, though, if you want to throw anything else in there. Um, just throw something out real quick yes, about please. where service dogs can't go. Yes, please. Uh, just, just because there are, while there are allowed so many places, which is wonderful, there are a couple places where they cannot go so anywhere that is a sanitary environment such as the icu in the hospital anywhere where there's going to be surgery performed while service dogs can accompany you to, to let's say the, the doctor anywhere where they need a, a sterile environment also anywhere where food is prepared so you can i know there is some maybe maybe nola you know this better i um you can go to a restaurant with your dogs but my understanding is you cannot go up to like a buffet where the food is actually being prepared i don't know Some I, I, I can tell you that answer shortly because that is actually on a a list that i have here it was a frequently asked question so as we keep going i will I will look that one up because I have a, and it's an ADA um, frequently asked question that, specifically a, about buffets. A tricky one. I know, I know for me, uh, churches are allowed to, an, another, let's say like a fraternal club are allowed to set their own rules. I mm -hmm. belong to a church and they, and they welcome service dogs with open arms. I've been to another church where they, where we were welcome as well, but they asked that the dog didn't come up to, for communion. Unfortunately, that with with the the person, um, that is their right. Um, unfortunately, uh, but what I've always found is that most churches are more more than welcoming. But I like to myself just give a little heads up, especially if I have a service dog in training that that I'm coming, just so they're not taken aback. And if and um, usually it's it's not not an issue. Uh, the airlines have their own kind of different sets of rules and it's a wonderful thing that they're actually changing them now and becoming so that those with service dogs are, are safer now because of those rules so i always suggest to even our own recipients before any flight make sure you get on that particular airline's website fill up they all have their their own different requirements now um and and check those out as well so that's that's all i have to say about that <laughs> i have hey, an answer i have I an have answer an about an the buffet yeah oh. i did too <laughs> okay go ahead see you um so i think we might be on the same page about this but because there are like because the public oh well, so basically i'm summing up from what, what i what understood from ada and from my own experiences because the food is still prepared in the back and they have the food up on the display like the buffet is one of those exceptions where dogs can go because they're you i mean if, if you, someone with a disability like me with my kaplan for example like if we have to go grab food like i just can't leave him at the table basically 
Yes, this is from ADA.gov. The question is, can a person bring a service animal with them as they go through a salad bar or other self-service food lines? Yes, service animals must be allowed to accompany their handlers to and through self-service food lines. Similarly, service animals may not be prohibited from communal food preparation areas such as and commonly found in shelters or dormitories. So there you go. Under We're all learning something. That's great. Yeah, I learned something today. Thank you. We have tons, we have tons more questions here. So let me get okay. to a, a couple more of these. Um, one is what breeds make a good service dog? For Champ, uh, mainly we use Labradors and Golden Retriever because we a lot of what our dogs will do will have something to do with retrieving. Those guys are pretty much naturals. They love the work. Um, but we've also actually also placed, we have a few doodles uh, in the service, and we've worked with a few, who knows what they were, they were rescue dogs, shelter dogs, phenomenal dogs. For us, the main thing is that we're looking for health and temperament. Guide Dogs for the Blind is also used as 70%, they said Labrador Retrievers because of their ability to, I mean, they're so food motivated, it's really easy. Their reputation, like they have a reputation of really just hardworking, always, always want to work, very dedicated. I know they use a good amount of Golden Lab mixes because it has, it brings out the good traits of both. So I know they use, don't use as much Goldens, uh, at least pure Goldens. Um, my screen reader is just like going off in my ears <laughs> all the chat messages um and then i know there are a few schools that uses german shepherd so actually seeing i um which they're based out of morristown new jersey um that's the oldest and the first guy like major um guide dog school that was founded in 1939 so they and they were originally actually guide dogs were actually started with blind veterans um so um, when they came back from the war and then they were, they became blind, there were, there were a lot of, lots and lots of German Shepherd dogs that, that accompanied them and they saw an instinct to whatever reason care for them. So that, that's how the, the whole thing started. But I know German Shepherds are still used. It's just harder for, for German Shepherds these days to, to be trained as intensively. So I know it, it's like more like case by case basis now, but mostly labs and goldens and lab golden mixes. I know there are poodles as well. There are a few schools I've heard of. My friend has a poodle. She's she lives in Nevada, um, and then because of her her allergy, um, she's a poodle guide dog handler. So there are a few schools that do that. I was gonna throw out the poodles. Those are those are full size tall yes. poodles. And mm -hmm. for those Standard. of you who have seen a poodle service dog, it I don't know. Every time I see one, I am taking pictures and going crazy because it's just something you don't see all that often. Um, and also the poodles I, are just funny. So yeah, mm -hmm. no, Nicole, go ahead. I muted myself. I'm sorry. We are the same. We So our organization has been around since 2015. And I did a study on all of our dogs that have come through our program last year and crunched the numbers. And we have had the highest success rate with our Labradors and our Goldens. So that's mainly what we use. But like you said, with allergies, half of our dogs for 2023 that we're already training are poodles. Oh, there, there's my Malinois, he's not a service dog, I apologize. But uh, um, we, we've been using more and more poodles. They've been wonderful, smart, and good good for our families with, with allergies. Great, I have a really great specific question from Sarah. How should event hosts handle competing ADA concerns? For example, a guest with a service dog and a guest with a severe dog allergy wanting to attend the same event in a space that doesn't allow separation. Don't everybody jump on that at once, I see that. Yeah, I think it's a great question, quite honestly. I don't really know the answer. I know that ADA does not, as far as a service dog, um, someone having, a, having an allergy to the dog um, does not preclude that person from being able to come to the event with yeah. their service dog. I don't really know if there's not enough room for separation. Our typical would be to encourage them to find a way for some separation. Um, but if you're 
truly saying that they're all going to be together in a closet size space. I don't know what the answer to that might be. I don't know if Nicole has had that issue or. Um, I've, I've had it several times come up and I can tell you how it was handled. In my experience, there's been multiple times that I've done classroom visits for education and there would be a child in there that was allergic. Now, depending on the severity, they would either have the, the child off to the side, we would do the presentation in the front, the child would sit in the back and they wouldn't pet the dog. At, at the end, I usually allow some petting, I'll, I'll divest whatever dogs in training, allow petting, that child wouldn't pet. If it was a severe allergy, unfortunately, they would do something else with the child. They'd go to the library or, or play a game with them, something fun. We've gone to a conference and brought service dogs in training with us. Uh, we had a situation with an airline where one of the passengers was allergic to dogs the airline actually offered them either to sit in the back of the plane, we would be towards the front, but they said their allergy was severe. So what the airline did was they gave them tickets to another flight. So they allowed us to keep our, our flight and the, the passenger with the allergy got received a different flight. And I believe that like an upgraded ticket as well. Great. I, I was looking, I know that I read something about allergies somewhere, but and I think it is kind of what you all just said. Um, the service dog handler is takes priority there. I, I believe I could be wrong about this. I will double check. Um, and but oftentimes it's it's up to the event person to make it work the best they can. And one thing I also wanted to point out that relays to this from from your slides nola is uh it's against the law to segregate service animals yes. you cannot yes. say we yeah. have the special section over here where you know service animals can be um you cannot do that so we've had patrons who have purchased tickets to events they they picked out their own seat this is the seat they want to go to and then someone next to them says no we don't want to sit next to a service dog well, then you can move the person that doesn't want to sit next to a service dog. Um, that is basically how it goes. <laughs> um, you can't move the person just because they have a service animal. We do have a lot of venues that have um, much smaller seats and the service, there's really not room for a service animal to be. And they will, sometimes no one will, uh, I will say most of the time, no one will think of this in advance. So the people will get there and then an usher or someone has to say, oh gosh, what do we do about the service animal? And then they move them to an accessible seat. Um, so a lot of places will ask in advance and their ticketing page or something will say, if you are bringing a service animal, let us know when you purchase the tickets and we can offer you an accessible seat and they will seat you in the, the wheelchair seats or the aisle seats or the, you know, the bigger seats. So, but you, you cannot, uh, segregate service animals from the rest of the audience um, just because they're a service animal. Go ahead, Sayun. I usually take, I usually put that in as a request, not more because the like, Kaplan can't fit in, but there have been times where I went to an enterprise center and the seats, the rows are so tight together where he could get jammed by the jump seats, the ones that are like that pops up when you stand up. And that has a lot of moving parts where his tail and is his hair could get jammed so i just honestly just do an accessible seating yeah and same thing great. with and, and on the on that same note um if i'm going to like there are a couple places where i just wouldn't use a dog and seek to use a white cane instead right places like the zoo was a great example of that like that could also be a safety and a distraction major distraction crisis i mean i just can't imagine bringing kaplan to a zoo not because he's not capable it's because it is just a mess right with other animals there um that same thing i'd say about concerting concerting events like if i know i want to go like see a, a like an artist or a singer or whatever um perform at a concert the volume is so loud that like i mean i feel like I, my ears start to ring so i i that's mm -hmm. just more of a concern more than anything and that i'd say that for most sporting events too i've been i've taken him to a blues game um, and that was fine. But like if I'm, when I'm going to Cardinals game Thursday, Kaplan will most, most likely not be there because it's going to be so packed. It's going to be so crowded. I know usually when they score a run, um, they also do like the, the, the fireworks and stuff at the top as well. So that, that could just be in itself 
too much for him to deal yes. with. So that's not something that as a handler, we always consider like what air, like what, I mean, attractions and facilities do, I mean, warrants us to not use a dog because it is just too taxing for us as a handler to manage that. But also it could be a jeopardizing experience. We don't want them to ever like, we take them to places that's so miserable and then like they just get, they just can't handle it because they, we also care for their mental health well-being and stuff as well. I can tell you, yes. I've actually been on a, a tour with multiple guide dogs at the zoo. Mm -hmm. um, we were there before the zoo opened, if I remember correctly. So there, mm -hmm. we weren't dealing with other people and we were doing very specific areas of the zoo. Yeah. Um, and so we didn't go into the antelope house. There were very specific mm -hmm. places. We didn't, this is when they had a petting zoo. We didn't go to the mm -hmm. petting zoo. Um, it was a really, as a sighted person, it was a really cool experience because oh, yeah. one, the guide dogs were all really great, but the, there was definite reactions from some of the zoo animals that right. we never, and we were with um, zoo personnel. Mm -hmm. And particularly there was a cheetah that was very interested in, in the dogs. The dogs had no reaction. They were just right. like, whatever I'm working. About their day. <laughs> just a, there was just a cat over there. Um, the cheetah had, had a very specific, there was a lot of like pacing and getting very, I'd never been to the zoo and you know, the cheetahs, I don't know if they're still like this, I don't remember, but they're not in those big um, netted domes. They're in a more open area mm -hmm. with the moats, you know? And that cheetah was like a step from the moat. It was like as close as it could be um, to where we were. So as a sighted person, I thought it was really cool. Um, I'm not right. sure that the, the um, cheetahs or the guide dogs um, were <laughs> thought it was that cool. Um, I also, I was going to ask you, Sayun, about places, and I was, this is for you too, Nicole, um, the different types of training, because um, I knew Sayun was going to the Cardinal game with us on Thursday, and I had other people tell me that they were not bringing their service animals because of the fireworks, specifically because of the fireworks. Yep. Um, and my thought was a person who has a service dog for PTSD, I would think that their dog may be trained more specifically for those loud noises and those reactions. But um, if, if you have any thoughts on that, that would be great. You know, that's a great question. They got me thinking about that actually for PTSD response. Um, I know my dog usually can handle it because like he, we been through like we sat through fourth of july um before i mean it wasn't like it could fully expose but like we were i guess relatively close vantage point like even inside of a home where i knew that there were like enough explosive fireworks like you could hear it rumble like through the house like by my apartment because i'm pretty high up um and we sat through thunderstorms so in those environmental things, like he absolutely doesn't care, but that doesn't obviously mean that every like guide dogs can can handle them, right? So because they're they're different beings, like humans, they're they're not built the same. They're they are not capable of the same task. Not not that they could perform the same task, but I think those fear reactions I think are so subjective. Like I and I could see that probably being translated to different PTSD dogs, like. While the training tactics may be the same, like the dogs that come out of leader dogs for, for the blind, they're based in Rochester, Michigan, compared to guide dogs for the blind in California, they use the same like food motivation tactic um, to train their dogs. Positive reinforcement is what they use a lot. And then when they, um, like I know places like CI and then Fidelco, which is, which is all German Shepherd guide dogs, they use more praise-based training methods. So they've different training methods suits different people's needs. I personally think positive reinforcement is great um, because they just love what they do. And they, if we're doing their task, it, there's like a cause and effect, right? They perform a task like finding curves or finding steps or finding stairs, and then they get traded for what they do. So that, that really reinforces that set of behaviors. And then they could get they can learn very quickly. Like when I went to go get him and worked with him for two weeks um, with an instructor in Oregon at the guide dog's campus, I literally had to treat him like all, this, all the time because that results in really good bond. And then that really carries over even to this day. Like I would have a treat pouch with me and I know that that's gonna be super helpful. Um, a little bit of spiel on guide dog training. <laughs> We do, we do, uh, our dogs are very much trained to be around 
gunfire or fireworks because that is a huge trigger for our veterans and our police, our EMS, our, our fire workers who who have PTSD. A really easy way for us, since we use so many Labradors, is we, we will use a dummy launchers. And what, what dummy launchers are is they sh they're they used in hunting training and they shoot this big, uh, it's a dummy, a, a retrieving dummy, this big, soft, fun, toy-like thing. And when it shoots, it's as loud as a shotgun. It's, it's used to desensitize hunting dogs to shotguns. But we'll use it with our labs. And for them, it's like, oh boy, oh boy, because as soon as it goes off, they get to run after a toy. So they do, but it's, it's one of those things that with our recipients, we caution just because you, you get a service service dog as with PTSD, one of the things that we always say is they only work in conjunction with therapy. So we're not saying, okay, I I'm, I'm suffer from severe PTSD. I just got my service dog. Now I'm going to go to watch some fireworks. We would not recommend that without discussing it with your therapist working up to that point, maybe starting with lower level sounds, working up to smaller crowds than larger crowds. So it's, it's eventually we would hope that they, they could get to that point. We, we have one of our recipients who is a huge Star Wars fan, just huge. And his big goal was to be able to go to Disney World. That's what he wanted to be able to do because he was he couldn't even leave his house. He was finally able to do that. He got to go to the Star Wars park at Disney and then even watch fireworks at Disney. And so it was life changing for him, but he didn't do it the very next day that he got his dog. They had to form a relationship, learn each other, learn about each other, and then take those small steps till they could do that large of an event. Great, thank you. I, you know, things that you don't think of as a person who doesn't have a service dog. Um, we have just a couple quite a couple minutes left. Um, we have a ton of questions. So for everybody who didn't get their questions in, I will send these over to Nicole and Nola and Sayun. And when we send out the the email, I'll try to get some more answers for you. But let's try to get one more, one or two more in there. Uh, how long does it take to get a service dog? So from as, a, as an applicant and a handler, it took me about, I want to say, this is pre-pandemic era, right? So um, I applied, actually, my, my I feel like it takes me back so long. Um, my my freshman, well, no, my, my senior year in high school, that's right, um, in the fall. So I submitted my initial applications. If you go to guidedogs.com, you can look at the checklist of what makes you eligible. So there are a couple pieces that needs to come together to for a blind or visually impaired uh, person um, for, for them to get a guide dog. And this is usually very similar kind of standards that are set forth by, by guide dog training facilities. Um, for one, you do need to be legally blind and then like not just visually impaired. So like 20 over 200 or, or worse um, with the, I mean, the correction. Um, so you have to be at least legally blind. Um, and so my screen reader is just like reading all these chats and it's so, it just completely caught me a guard. <laughs> um, and um, you're, you usually work with an orientation mobility specialist. They're certified professionals um, that work with a lot of students and the clients even to make sure that their walking skills are really solidified and then that they, they can travel and maneuver around different spaces independently. So unfortunately, there are, you know, there have been clients that came to guide dogs. Um, I mean, even when I was in class and then this woman just did not know where she was going with the dog and she had to keep on using her cane and the, and the rule of thumb is that you either choose one or the other. You can't just work a dog and use a cane, right? That can be very confusing. And that kind of defeats the purpose of using a dog. So you have to have really exceptional um, orientation mobility skills um, when you use a cane. And, the, and there are different guide dog schools that actually offer those programs as well, like accelerated um, comprehensive O&M training and could really usually consult their like folk rehab agencies. So when I started the application, um, I actually wasn't sure where I wanted to go to college. So just on a personal note, I had to pause my application until I made up my mind um, when I started getting some acceptance letter from five of six schools out of colleges I've applied to. And once I made up my mind to come to SLU, I called Guide Dogs again. It's like, hey, I'd like to resume my application. Um, what do we need? So 
I had my certified O&M instructor um, sign off and then do a initial checklist and fax that in. Um, and then I had to go get um, the physical wellness um, exam from my primary care physician. Um, so that needs to come into play, right? Because being, um, being able to handle a service animal requires a certain level of, of physical health. And then that was super important for guide dogs as well because they need to be highly maintained. They need, they need to be in really top shape. Like I need to groom and make sure like at least once a week, especially during a season like this where it's just shedding a ton, I'll make sure that you can financially support the dogs. That's pretty important. Um, now guide dogs is one of the few guide dog schools because they're so large and and then so well funded, they, they actually provide all veterinary care. Um, from when you, the minute you get your dog until even when they retire. So after they retire from their guide work career, um, guide dogs will continue to fund them um, kind of throughout their, their medical bills and stuff. So that, that's been a huge kind of deciding factor when I looked at different schools, um, aside from training methods and, and then places where they could work, um, how, how well they could, could they support me in, in our, as a team throughout, the, throughout our working career and beyond. So once that all came into pieces, um, they have actually sent a representative from um, one of their field representative from Guide Dogs um, to look at kind of my home environment. So at the time I was with my parents in the suburb of St. Louis in the West, um, and they've, they've kind of just did a comprehensive interview question. Is there any selections, any preference? How fast do you walk? And we do this thing called Juno Walk. So um, the field instructor actually had his harness where he holds on to like the chest strap of the harness to mimic the sensation of walking with the dog. So that gave him a more, more an idea of how, how, what you could expect when you get your dog. So the instructor would be holding the other end of the harness and you did teach you how to grip the harness properly and make sure like you get, you're comfortable with the idea that there's something always pulling on you. So uh, my right hand is my dominant hand. So the dog always stays on my left. And that's for vice versa for folks who are left-handed. The dogs goes on your right, um, and and you use your left dominant hand to grab a door, uh, hold a handrail, shake hands, etc. Um, so once that all kind of materializes, they have a pretty good profile of of who I am as a person and what what kind of stage of life I'm in too. That's pretty important because when I when Kaplan um, eventually retires, many many years hopefully down the road from now. Um, I, I'm going to be at a very different point in my life. I mean, I'm, I would have been done with, with done with college. So, I mean, I don't need a dog that is as agile. Um, but I will be traveling quite actively, or at least, at least I hope, um, to continue to do what I do. Um, therefore, there's the dog that I, my second guide dog, will kind of be tailored towards the kind of my phase in that life as well. Um, not that Kaplan is highly adaptable. He is very highly adaptable. The different environments but they they all take that into consideration and once they had a dog that was ready um because they're continuously training and issuing these dogs that are deemed class ready um they called me sometime in june i believe about a month before i flew out so they booked some of my plane tickets and it's a residential facility so once i got the dog and they got accepted for a guide dog um they basically set me up with a flight to leave at the end of July, um, towards the end of July, 2019, to Oregon campus. And then I, I actually live there, they cook for you. Um, probably the best meals that I've gotten throughout two weeks. Um, and then they, they feed you, they keep your room clean for you. And then you just live there. And your sole goal here is at Guide Dogs is to just learn to work with the dog. We'll learn a lot of technicality, mechanics of, I mean, just bonding with an animal. So that's, that's been super cool. We've, we've also did a lot of different work in various environments in that Oregon area that mimics what I would experience back home. So um, shopping malls, um, department stores, we've been on escalators, elevators. Um, we even went to a local community college because that simulates the work environment that he could expect. And that's where I've learned to do a lot of back chaining. Um, we went to like just grocery stores. We've been out on the on the train platform. Oregon and Portland actually has really great public transit because I've told them I'm going to be using Metrolink to get around here in the buses. So we've been on buses, we've been on trains. And then they, they that 
basically was all summed up in two weeks. Um, so I could experience how to work the dog in those environments when they board the train and get off the train. How do they handle drop off platforms? Like, are they going to, is he going to keep me away from it? Which he does. And, and then basically I spent time to doing that for two weeks. And then at the end of that program, you have a little celebration ceremony, um, to graduate with your dog because your dog is now, um, part of um, my life. Right. And then we, we just completed that initial training together, um, where I've learned more or less than him because he already completed his training. It was class ready. So we return home and then we kind of get settled in. So that process probably took about a year. Um, I've been hearing though that um, because of the pandemic and the dogs have been so backed up, um, it's taking a lot longer, like anywhere from one to three years uh, for a successor, like the folks who are getting their first dog who have applied throughout COVID and people who are looking for their successor um, dogs. Um, so that's that's been quite interesting journey for me. It's just to got, kind of navigate that transition um, from move, com, coming back from Oregon and to college and, and everything else. Great. Thank you, Seyun. I apologize, everyone. It is 10.03 and we have got to go um, because we have to let our service uh, people go. Um, I have just a few last announcements here before we go. Um, there, we did have about a dozen questions left, so I will send those out. I apologize to everybody who we, we couldn't get through, um, but I, just a couple last announcements and then I'll let you guys go. Uh, the June meetup will be June 15th from 8.30 to 10 a.m. And we will be talking about promoting accessible services. I know a lot of these places spend so much time and effort and money on having things like ASL and audio description and live captioning, and then no one uses it because no one knows they have it. So we'll be talking about promoting your accessible services. And also Mind's Eye is having an accessible AD movie night. Um, Seiyun, I don't know if I have sent this information to you yet, but it would be a great thing for your social club to do. Uh, yeah. That will be at MX Movies on Wash Ave on May 10th. Uh, there will be open audio description. So everyone in the theater will hear audio description if they are hearing. There will be open captions. So everyone in the theater will see captions if they are seeing. Uh, so it will be uh, very accessible. Uh, there is a QR code on the screen for that. There's also a bit.ly at bit.ly dash AD movie night. And Seiyun and I will send you the info for that and for everyone else. Uh, we legally can't tell you what the movie is but it's May 10th and it's a new release and there's gonna be some action and some heroes in it. Cool. So, and also we're going to have a very special strange donut will be part of that. So there you go. We hope to have lots of you there. Please feel free to bring your service animals. <laughs> also a reminder about ACA ACAC sponsorships. Um, we'd like to have some cash to pay all of these folks. That would be great. And thank you to our current sponsors, Amarin, Illinois, Lighthouse for the Blind, and United Way of Greater St. Louis. And of course, thank you to our panelists, Nicole, Nola, and Seyun. Thank you to our ASL interpreters from LAMP, Katie and David. Thank you to our CART interpreter from Here Inc., Tracy, and our audio describer from Mind's Eye, Sarah. And of course, as always, um, thank you all for joining. We hope that you will fill out your survey and uh, I will be in touch with a video with more questions answered with more resources. Uh, somebody asked about a list of resources of service animal providers. We will include that. We will include um, lots of things. So thank you all. Thanks. And uh, we will be in touch. Thanks for going an extra six minutes with us. Bye.